How are you? I'm doing pretty good today. Good. My first ever silent retreat. Last night was a little wonky, but doing good today. Yeah. <laughs> Things can get weird around here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is, um, my life feels a bit like a Venn diagram of two worlds. And it's probably been this way for quite a long time. And sometimes I use the 3D, 5D analogy. And when I'm at something like this, I can really get into that space of pure consciousness. The work that I do, I do deep healing work with clients. I do my morning meditations at home. I can really get there. Hmm. And then, I don't know what it is, the ego, pain body, like loves to just slap me back into where I'm snapping at my husband about how he loaded the dishwasher or something totally ridiculous. Mm. Um, so it's like, I see it, I know how to be there, pure consciousness, but I guess any advice on does the Venn diagram keep moving? Is it different for everybody? Do you eventually pop out and stay in the 5D pure consciousness world? I think there's like the Venn diagram and then there's like one big circle that's so big you can't see the edges of it and you don't know it's there. And that's what's always there and it's always operating. And then those other circles start to like disappear. Okay. So such that you could still perceive, I think we're getting a little high pitch feedback. Oh, he's not there. Um, you start to perceive that you, you can categorize experience in one sense. You could pick one experience out from another, consciousness out from sound and so forth. Um, you, can, you can see thought as thought, experience thought as thought and consciousness. Um, and then there's a sort of, that's maybe one circle and another circle is more just a immersed experience. Um, but even those sort of blend together or dissipate. So you can you can sort of pick out the, you can differentiate in one sense. And at the same time, nothing's ever differentiated at all. And so it's kind of like the infinite Venn diagram with the little parts of the Venn diagram in the middle that are maybe expressing one moment or another, but the the truth of the wholeness isn't really lost. But it's not really a wholeness as much as an emptiness. And that becomes crystal clear. Uh, and, and what happens then is these very um, human experiences actually become, in my experience, really important to address. So like you said, snapping at somebody or you know, those sorts of things, like you just can't ignore it anymore. You can't ignore when you know, something, something feels somewhat triggering and then it expresses in a way that doesn't make sense, it doesn't hook together, maybe it's unkind to someone else or yourself and you just have to investigate it because there's, because there's nowhere for it to hide such that there's a Venn diagram you're not experiencing in that moment because you're experiencing all of it and you can't ignore it anymore. And so it becomes important to kind of address everything as it comes up or probe everything as it comes up or inquire or surrender. And so a, a part of this, um, this journey, certainly if you consider it like the Fetter model, um, is reactivity, is desire and ill will, and really looking into triggers and seeing, do I have to react? Um, and this is in particular with humans. And reactions come in all kinds of forms. They can come in being you know, um, irritable and short, or they can come in being controlling, they can come in being avoidant. But really looking into our triggers and seeing like, okay, what are the beliefs there, really? There's, there's always an emotional experience as well. Maybe it's anger or frustration or fear of abandonment or loneliness. These are all going to play in. But when it comes to reactivity, there are specific beliefs that, um, that are quite distinct, actually, and findable that, that we sort of give ourselves permission to react. Um, <clears throat> and there there's, can be described to be a reaction gap between stimulus and response or between conditions that, that are triggering, let's say, and how we actually respond to those or act on those conditions. And 
by making a study, which is an experiential thing, you know, feeling into what it actually feels like to be in that gap and not react. It's hugely valuable. Learn what it feels like to be in a gap and not react and see what thoughts come, what beliefs about that come. Why do I have to react? Why do I have to tell that person they, you know, they, they should have done what I thought they should have done? You know, why am I certain of that? And what's the cost, you know? Um, and so sometimes just looking into these very practical things and once you're more comfortable in that gap, uh, you, you can actually look and see, is the belief that I have to react at all true? Is it even true? Because it feels quite true when we're reacting to anything in any way. It can be reacting in a sort of non-specific way to anything, you know, politics, the government, the world, um, our bodies, our emotions. Like we Although react. when I do react and kind of do a post-mortem, I can see that I didn't need to react. This is different. Okay. Yeah, this is different because it, it's good to do that. That's, that's, not a, that's not wrong at all. That's a good practice. This, is, this goes really right into the core of the reaction itself um, because we can all relate to, I don't know, situations in life where, you know, the, the, the common one, I think, would be like if we react to somebody, we, get, we lose our temper with someone, right? We have a lot of anger or something, and we lose our temper, and then we apologize. And then we do it again, and we apologize, and do it again, and we, we notice cycles, right? I'm not saying this is you, but this is something we can all relate to. In those cases, that's exactly what's happening. After the fact, we're looking back going, oh, I, didn't, I shouldn't have done that. Let me make amends or, you know, but it's like, but then you do it again and again and again. And then maybe, you know, you really put a stop to it in one area of your life and it pops up somewhere else. That's reactivity. So that's why this particular type of investigation I'm talking about really gets to the core of it. And when it, what's interesting is when you investigate it this way, it actually gets to it in the core of reactivity in one avenue, one situation, but it actually will apply to all kinds of situations. You'll find that you just don't react to things anymore. Um, you respond still, and you may have to respond in very direct ways sometimes, but it's not a reaction. It's quite different. There's nothing, there's nothing unconscious about it anymore. Um, and there's nothing that is compelling, that, that sort of um, feels like you're forced into a, into a response. It doesn't feel like that at all. It, it feels much more like you have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's paradoxical, but when, we, when we're very mind identified, when we really think we have a lot of choices is often when we're really at the mercy of conditioning. On the other hand, when, when we start to actually see through that sense of agency, we, we start to feel like we have infinite choice in a, in a strange way, not in a personal way, but there's infinite possibilities and they're all available. When we're reacting, there's one possibility. There's actually two, is to react or to try to stop ourselves from reacting. And when that's extreme, it feels like addiction. Addiction feels like I either do it, I take the drug, I take the hit, um, or, I, or I try to stop myself from it and exert all this other kind of effort. But sooner or later, it snaps back. That's a very limited scope of choices that we perceive we have. And it's ultimately because of the kind of reactivity in there. So it's somewhere to look. And um, like I said, the, the first orientation is one that's really counterintuitive for most people and it's to go into the discomfort of the gap. Mm -hmm. The discomfort of something happens, you know, just find whatever it is in, in life that triggers you every time, like tra traffic is a big one for people for whatever reason or whatever it is. Or and something just, loaded in the dishwasher wrong. Dishwasher, I mean, I don't want to be specific <laughs> to your situation, but it could be that, right? <laughs> um, and just stop and feel that, oh my God, that the, the urge to just, tell that person what I need them to do and that they're wrong and that they did it wrong and I've told them before and, you know, um, feel that. It's really uncomfortable at first. And it, you may not want to feel it at all. It'll just be like this avoidant sort of pattern. But if you stop, you know, enough times, you'll actually start to realize like, oh, I can actually sit in this discomfort. It's rather discomfort. It'll feel, it'll feel like really like restlessness, like, a, like an intense restlessness. Stay with it and it'll calm down. And this, by the way, is for anyone <clears throat> awakening, not awakening, even if you're not interested in the subject, this is hugely valuable. And I think, I really think anyone can do this, but I do think it's so deeply embedded in our behaviors and our beliefs that it's pretty hard to do before awakening, like thoroughly, um, but you certainly can. You can certainly get at some of it. Um, and once you're, once you're sort of comfortable in this comfort, such that even though you're uncomfortable, you have this raw discomfort, you're not convinced you need to do something about it. 
that's a, that's huge progress. You're not convinced that I need to do something now. I can actually stay with this, even though it definitely is not comfortable. Then you can you you have access to the actual beliefs. Like there's a belief here that I need to um, do something about the fact that even though my husband knows I like him to load the dishwasher this way or whatever it is, uh, um, I, he knows I, I want him to do it that way, but he just didn't. He didn't do it the way I wanted him to. That's the simple fact, and that's why I feel so triggered. Now, do I actually have to react to that? Well, no, I don't, because I'm not. And then where is it that, that the actual reaction starts? This is the crux. Where does the reaction actually start? Because it really feels like there's something that's making me react, like I'm it's making me. And just by looking and looking and looking, at some point, it can literally just sort of, it's, it's like it unwires itself. There's no reaction. There's no reason to react, and you never had to at all. And um, as I was talking to someone who came up yesterday, it can actually feel rather like something's missing when that breaks. It can feel like a part of you that really had a lot of buy-in to yourself, that you identified with, is just not there all of a sudden. You know, like who am I? Who am I without my reactivity? Who am I without my irritability? Or who am I without the problem I'm always, you know, putting my energy into? Um, it, it frees up a lot of energy, but it can also feel like, wow, hmm, what do I do now? You know, I was like, I don't have problems anymore. There's nothing to react to, <laughs> really. Like, nothing's making me mad. I don't think anyone is, you know, whatever people do, that's just what they're doing. It's not my business, and I don't need to react either way because it doesn't really fix it anyway. It doesn't change anything. You just suddenly realize, like, hmm. There's not, there's no big project anymore. So with that reactivity disappearing, often um, people will feel like a vast majority of their suffering went away. Not all of it, but it can feel like a, quite a bit of your suffering actually just that vaporized. And it's kind of a self-imposed suffering, a feeling of self-imposed suffering or struggle. I remember for me, after my initial shift many years ago, um, one of the things that kept playing in my mind was this verse from the Bible that said, have you suffered so many things in vain? And it was just, it was, I was like funny actually because I, I just, it's like the moment I stopped struggling, I realized what I was struggling against, which was myself. And then it was like, I was on both sides of that and I just stopped. And I was like, oh, I never had to do that. I never had to struggle. I never had to react to anything. Um, so... And sometimes I can see the belief and I think even know where it came from. Like it, a lot of it's childhood programming or what mm -hmm. you were brought up with or like the one who wants to control the way things are done like is Grandma Arnold. Like, yeah. So I see it. I intellectualize it. And then I guess it's Do you stop? letting go. Yeah, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Like I sit with the discomfort like it wants to come out of my mouth to yeah. do something. And was, I'm like, no, that's... Yeah, and it can help it, it can really help to frame it into what is actually, what you're actually reacting to. You're reacting to the fact that someone's not doing what you expect them to do, usually is what it is. Yeah. And, and, it, and someone's not providing what you want them to provide. So I, the examples I give that can be a little obscure sometimes are like, um, if you are... Um, if sometimes if someone it feels like someone's ignoring you, let's say, or something like that, but but you notice it, and it's like you're upset with them for not acknowledging you or giving you validation or whatever. Even someone you don't really know in a work situation or a party situation, what you don't realize is you actually want them to comfort you. You're upset with that person because they're not comforting you. They're not soothing you. And when you see it, it's different. It's different when you go, oh my god. The truth of the matter is that person's just doing whatever they're doing. But my story is I want that person to soothe me right now and they're not doing it. And it feels so totally different when you see that. Oh, okay. What does it feel like that that person's not soothing me right now? And you might feel this like, Ur. which you might feel first is the mind will get a hold of that and won't want you to see it. It'll, you'll just get very distracted because this can be really slippery stuff. I've worked with people on this. It can be extremely slippery. They'll be gung-ho about doing this. They're like, oh yeah, let's, let's look into reactivity. And we start to get down to these really subtle triggers or even childhood triggers. And I don't hear from them for nine months. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. That's literally what happens sometimes. You know, and, and that, that's how this is. It's so slippery because these are really early 
developed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so you can also trace them to childhood sometimes. It can yeah. be like that parent, you know, whatever it is, they, they didn't give me a sense of stability. And so I'm now I want my spouse to give me a sense of stability or order or acknowledgement or, does that make sense? Yeah, and that's where a lot of the beliefs come from too. Yeah. We're just programmed with them. Yeah, and so I guess my follow-on question is, I, great advice for working with the reac reactivity, but kind of going back to the Venn diagrams mm -hmm. and then the bigger, broader, does the reactivity ever go away? It will. Completely? Mm -hmm. It can. Okay. Yeah. Yep. But the thing is, when we look through the lens of reactivity, it's very hard to imagine what it's like without it because we'll even look at people and think they're reacting when they're not because we were so conditioned through reactivity that we assume everyone else is, you know, and sometimes they are and sometimes they're not, right? Because we look through that lens. And when it stops, it's just really obvious, you know? Um, that response, responding to something isn't always reactivity, but you know when it is. Mm -hmm. Reactivity is, is, is kind of unnecessary, unconscious, reacting to something that's not actually um, meaningful, usually. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually matter. And that's why usually afterward you can kind of look back and go, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. I didn't need to do that. It's unnecessary. But that doesn't stop the reaction. Stopping, stopping the reaction is getting to the heart of it and seeing the belief that says I have to react in the first place. And it's usually structured in the form of what is this person not providing that I want them to provide? And seeing it that way and feeling into what does it feel like when I know that person is just not providing that? It could be they're not listening to me, they're not acknowledging me, they're not doing what I tell them to do, whatever. You know, just feel into that. Wow, what does that feel like? And you, you'll feel a feeling of helplessness ultimately. That's what it feels like when you're like kids are the best, right? If your kids are, you know, being kids and not doing what you've told them 150 times that you want them to do in that situation, and you and you just feel that anger, like you know that frustration, you're really just looking at that child saying they're not doing what I want them to do, and that makes me as a parent because I'm trying to uphold this role that makes me feel out of control, and that's not and that people are terrified of feeling out of control, right? Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the Venn diagram to like reframe everything, um, reactivity is what makes, first of all, awakening and this whole thing, you know, the more we touch in, the more we start to realize that infinite Venn diagram circle that it's not even a circle that I'm talking about that's important. Um, but the, the relative circles inside, they're overlapping. Reactivity makes them feel different. It makes them feel like, like argh, struggling against one another, and it's like either one or the other, and you like tend to flip back between one experience and another. Like and one feels good, and one doesn't. One feels good, good and one doesn't. One yeah. is pushing and pulling, and mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of that sense of desire, well, with desire and aversion or desire and ill will going away, you can still perceive something that's pleasant versus unpleasant. But what's so surprising is because something's pleasant or unpleasant does not mean you have to like it or not like it or prefer it or not prefer it. They're not the same thing at all, but they really feel the same when there's reactivity. When there's not reactivity, then it's just a simple, simple noticing of something that, that may, might feel a little bit more enjoyable than something else. And even that starts to go away, in my experience. Slowly over time, it's like very hard to even tell what's enjoyable or not enjoyable anymore because really they become thoughts. It's very interesting. Um, but the... The, the sense of, yeah, bouncing back and forth between two experiences really intensely or trying to, any struggle with those tends to go away. So they probably just soften in general and that's probably what makes them start to just dissipate or even overlap more. Or you just, you're just allowing. Yeah. You're allowing it all to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then even, even the fluctuation that feels like it happens after awakening where it's like meing and being and the sense of contraction and expansion that's so dramatic in a sense. Um, to, to some degree, the, the ups and downs of that just, just stabilize. It's less ups and downs with it over time. But the other part of it is even the essence of what a contraction is and even the essence of what expansion is, if you look in direct experience, you can't actually differentiate those anymore. So then they actually start interpenetrating. And interpenetration is a hard thing to talk about in a diagram like we're talking, but it's noticeable, very noticeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really, it's actually rather enjoyable. It's when integration and disintegration are coming into balance. Okay. Is that helpful? Yes, very helpful. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Come back next year and give me a different kind of Venn diagram. Okay. <laughs>